On this episode of Women Behind Bars, one woman allegedly murdered her elderly parents. Yeah, there was an obvious sign of a, a struggle with the blood trail. There were pieces of broken frying pan, obvious um, stab wounds, blunt force trauma. There, were, there was no blood on my clothes. There was no blood on my shoes. How is it possible to have done that with no blood anywhere? Then Marianne Acker tells her story. She was convicted of murdering one man in Hawaii and one in California. He didn't threaten me. Bitch, if you don't do what I tell you, I'll kill you. Shot twice, once in the ankle, once in the head, and left to die here. Two women, two brutal crimes. These are the stories of Deborah Perringer and Marianne Acker. On November 2, 2001, Lloyd and Agnes Courtney were found dead in their home. Each had been stabbed and bludgeoned repeatedly. It was very brutal. It was very bloody. Collectively, Lloyd and Agnes Courtney had been beaten, stabbed, and cut a total of 75 times. Police became suspicious of the Courtney's daughter, 48-year-old Deborah Perringer, on the night they informed her of her parents' death. She had a very flat effect when they told her. They noticed that she had a Band-Aid or bandage on her left index finger. When they asked her about it, she said that she had cut her finger doing dishes that morning. Was Deborah Perringer framed in the brutal slang of her parents? Or was this a calculated murder for profit scheme? Deborah Lynn Perringer was the only child born to Lloyd and Agnes Courtney in June of 1953 in a middle-class neighborhood in Fort Worth, Texas. We had to leave it to Beaver home, and so did the neighbors, and, and so did our family, and everybody around us that we knew. We were all alike. The Courtneys went to church every, every Sunday. It was a big part of their lives. She was a wife and a homemaker. But she was very active in the community. She was a child advocate and volunteered her time. She loved to sing. By all accounts, a very, very sweet lady. Lloyd Courtney had been employed with the Fort Worth Police Department for almost 50 years. He originally started as a um, certified peace officer, worked his way up, and worked as a latent print examiner. My dad was the greatest man I ever knew. She was his pride and joy. When she was 31, Deborah enrolled at Texas Wesleyan University in Fort Worth to become an accountant. While still in college, she met her future husband, Paul Perringer. The day I met my husband, I knew I was going to marry him. And so um, I had to wait six months for him to ask me out. And uh, that was it. And on January 16, 1988, the 34-year-old co-ed got married. Almost a year and a half later, she graduated college. I got a job with Tarrant County in Fort Worth uh, as an auditor, and I did that for uh, nine years and really enjoyed it. Five years after the couple married, Deborah gave birth to a baby girl named Angela. About three or four years later, I started suffering from depression, and um, I was put on an antidepressant. Deborah says the depression so incapacitated her that she was unable to work. Forced to retire early, she went on disability. I was treated for depression at first, and then they found out that it was really a bipolar disorder. And, um, you know, you can have the highs and the lows. At the same time, her husband Paul contracted a debilitating case of hepatitis and lost his job as a plumber. The couple, unable to make ends meet, leaned on Deborah's parents for financial support. Uh, my parents uh, helped me financially because um, when I was on the uh, bipolar highs, I would go shopping. Retail therapy, oh, it worked wonders. For my mood, it didn't do anything at all for our finances. The way that Deborah handled her money didn't please her parents. She owed them in upwards of $40,000. Some of the family members had said the reason that Lloyd Courtney had actually gone back to work after he had retired was because of the amount of money that he was having to give to Miss Perringer and, and her husband, and that he was angry about that. He didn't want to work anymore. 
Despite the strain Deborah's financial difficulties and bipolar disorder caused her family, she maintained a close connection with her parents and saw them frequently. On the morning of November 2, 2001, Deborah visited with her mom and dad. I went over to my parents' house, and my mother wasn't home yet, um, so I sat and talked to my dad. He was playing on the computer. My mother got home, and we visited for a little bit, and then I had to go shopping. She said that when she left, that her uh, mother and father were fine. That afternoon, a neighbor became concerned when he noticed that Lloyd Courtney hadn't left for work at his usual time. The neighbor across the street noticed that my dad had not left for work, and that was like, I think, 1 o'clock. So the neighbor became concerned, and he ended up calling the police. Later that day, the police arrived on the scene. The police officer peered inside and noticed the contents of a purse had been dumped. It appeared that the house had been burglarized. He got a key from a neighbor and entered the home, and that's when he found the bodies. It was uh, extremely um, violent uh, crime scene. It looked like the, the dining room table leg, which had been broken or knocked off, apparently in the struggle, was then used after Lloyd was probably down already, face down. To, to beat him on the back of the head. And then there was also a blood trail from the dining area into the um, southwest bedroom where Agnes was located. And then when they went to the back bedroom, their bedroom, my mother was on the... Um, <laughs> I remember the picture. 71-year-old Agnes Courtney was found in a bedroom next to the bed, which was soaked in blood and littered with pieces of cast iron skillets. She had been cut or stabbed 22 times and had suffered multiple injuries to the head. Her throat had also been slit. She and her 75-year-old husband Lloyd were pronounced dead on the scene. Cause of death, multiple stab wounds and blunt force trauma. When Women Behind Bars continues, Lloyd Courtney's body was found in the dining room, but his right leg had a note that was attached to his pants by a small white-handled paring knife. On the morning of November 2nd, 2001, 48-year-old Deborah Perringer visited with her parents police officer and fingerprint expert Lloyd Courtney and his wife Agnes. Later that day, police arrived at the Courtney residence and found that the couple had been stabbed and bludgeoned to death. Police discovered a note on one of the victims. Lloyd Courtney's body was found in the dining room, but his right leg had a note that was attached to his pants by a small white-handled paring knife. And the note said, Something, that, something to the effect of, look what I learned in prison, thanks for the memories, and then there was a string of expletives, and then it said, you better watch who you let in through the door next time, ha, 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 ha. The note implied that the crime had been committed by someone that he had put in prison. Later that evening, when police notified Deborah that her parents had been killed, they were surprised by her lack of emotion. They both noted that her reaction was somewhat odd. She appeared to be upset, but never actually cried any tears. The police came at 10.30 and um, told me that they'd been murdered, and I just, I just shut down. I just went inside myself. She immediately mentioned the possibility that um, the family had always worried that Mr. Courtney would be murdered by someone who had recently gotten out of prison, um, somebody he had helped put away, which was, of course, you know, co coincidental based on the, the letter that was found with Mr. Courtney's body. Growing up with a policeman as a dad, he always got threatening phone calls, threatening letters. Um, so always in the back of my mind was that fear that one day, it would really happen. And when it did, 
I just, I just couldn't, I, I didn't function. Deborah claimed that her father had testified in a gang-related trial and had been receiving death threats, but the police could find no evidence of such threats. In reference to th threats made uh, to Lloyd, uh, there were never any reported uh, to the police department, uh, never to his supervisors that we know of. If someone was angry because of a conviction, they would most likely lash out at the detective who was most responsible for that case, not um, an employee who just analyzed some evidence. The police investigated that thoroughly. They were never able to locate anybody um, who had recently gotten out. They talked to co-workers, supervisors at the police department, all of whom said it's common that if you are receiving some sort of threat to alert your supervisors, nobody had ever been alerted that there was any type of a threat ever made. Mr. Courtney had not testified in court in a number of years. Police also had suspicions about the authenticity of the note. The note, just it just did not look right. It did not look like something that someone would have done uh, come from prison to get revenge for being sent away uh, and leave a note like that. It looked like someone who was trying to cover up, you know, what they had done and, and put it off on someone else. A cut on Deborah's finger and bruises on her arms also raised officers' suspicions. Ms. Perringer stated to the police that she had fallen down the stairs on November the 2nd when she had overslept from a nap. Whenever we interview somebody who possibly has something to do with the offense, see if they have any type of injuries on their hands, wounds that would have been inflicted on them from the victim. The cut on Deborah's finger wasn't, I mean, like a, a gashing wound, but it was noticeable. When they asked her about it, she said that she had cut her finger doing dishes that morning. And I um, was washing some dishes, and I, uh, you know, jam my hand down in the dishwater and cut my finger on a knife. And so I put a Band-Aid on it and then I went over to my parents' house. I went in the kitchen and I saw a few little dishes and I thought, well, you know, I'll wash them while I'm waiting. And so my Band-Aid got wet and I just took it off and I didn't think anything of it. And I didn't realize that, that it was still bleeding. Investigators spent four days at the crime scene and recovered a large amount of blood evidence and the murder weapons. A paring knife, four shattered cast iron skillets, and a table leg. We believe that it is likely that when Mr. Courtney was struck, he was initially struck by some sort of an object. There was a table leg that had some of his blood on it, and then the cast iron skillet. It was a very, very brutal, bloody scene, and they suspected from the beginning that the killer likely injured themselves during the attack, and possibly the killer's blood was also in the house. So it became very significant from the beginning to collect as much blood evidence as possible and for that blood evidence to be tested uh, against their suspects as well against, as against their victims. Despite her explanations, police quickly zeroed in on Deborah Perringer as a prime suspect. From the time of the uh, offense occurred, we had obvious suspicions that it was Deborah. One of the neighbors told the police that she had seen Deborah about 10:15 that morning outside of the Courtney's home, walking towards her car. Then they turned to me because they found out I had been there that morning. She maintained her innocence from the time the police first talked to her. There were there was no blood on my clothes. There was no blood on my shoes, and uh, they said that no one had washed up in the house. They checked the drains. How is it possible? to have done that with all of that blood, have no blood in the car, no blood anywhere on you, and yet no one washed up in the house. It doesn't make sense. 17 days after the murder, police executed a search warrant at Deborah's house. We didn't find any pieces of frying pan, any bloody clothing. Um, we collected some knives to comp possibly compare uh, to the knives of, uh, that we found at the scene. Uh, but nothing ever that actually um, incriminated her. The only thing that of note that was found in Miss Perringer's car was in the trunk, and there was actually a purchased copy from a bookstore of the, the Texas Probate Code, a book um, that explained how the probate code was used, um, how wills are executed, um, timelines. My mother gave us that book 
to try to get us to make our own wills after our daughter was born. By canvassing the neighborhood, police found an eyewitness who had spotted a man in the Courtney's backyard on the day of the murder. There was a neighbor who lived almost directly behind the Courtney's. She got up and um, went outside and, and, and reported that there was a man dressed in coveralls in the Courtney's uh, backyard. She assisted police in, in drawing a composite sketch. If that person existed, we never did identify anyone. But I don't think anything was ever done with that. I don't, it wasn't put on the, the news or anything of that nature. I think the police had basically decided that that wasn't the route they were going to go. No arrests were initially made, but five months later, DNA testing came back, linking Perringer to the crime scene. A warrant was issued for Deborah's arrest. We did DNA analysis on several blood samples that were found in the house. There was an enormous amount of blood that came back to both Lloyd or Agnes Courtney. However, there were six samples that were tested in the crime lab that came back to Deborah Perringer. Perringer was arrested at 8 a.m. Friday, April 19, 2002, after dropping off her daughter at school. When she was arrested and, and advised that she was under arrest for capital murder, uh, once again, she had a very flat effect. I, I uh, shut down again. When they handcuffed me and put me in the car, I was just, I was just in shock. When Women Behind Bars continues. We believe that on the morning of, the de uh, of their death, that Mr. Courtney probably got into some sort of a verbal altercation with Deborah and that the assault started on Mr. Courtney. And later in this episode of Women Behind Bars, Marianne Acker is accused of murder in two states. I was arguing with him about that and suddenly he held the gun on me and threatened me. Bitch, if you don't do what I tell you, I'll kill you. In early 2003, Deborah Perringer was the main suspect in the murder of her parents after investigators found her blood at the crime scene. Perringer claimed that an ex-con had killed her parents as an act of revenge against her father, a police officer. Perringer's defense attorney argued that although Deborah was at her parents' home on the day they were murdered and her blood from a cut was found at the crime scene, she did not kill them. She testified in her own defense on her own behalf that she had cut her finger the morning uh, washing dishes at her own home and later went to her parents' house and was doing dishes. The bandage became wet and while doing some light housekeeping, she had blood droplets uh, that that were in various parts of the house, and that's the way they explained away the blood. And then her blood just happens to be in the exact same locations that the killer would have touched, and you left a large amount, what was described as a large amount of blood, on the door going into this bedroom that just happens to be where Agnes Courtney was found. That's not very believable. But the defense disputed that the amount of blood was enough to implicate Deborah. What they didn't tell you was it was a little drop, a drop on the table a little smudge on the door. The amount of Deborah Perringer's blood it depends on who you ask. The defense is going to say that they were very, it was a very minute amount, little droplets here and there. The police would tell you that they were actually significant amounts. It was, it was a smear on the mirror or on the knife drawer. It was, it was visible to the eye, so therefore it was, it was significant. Prosecutors made a case that Perringer had financial motive to kill her parents and that she cut her finger while attacking them. We believe money was the motive to kill Mr. and Mrs. Courtney. Mr. and Mrs. Courtney both had been financially supporting Deborah Perringer and her husband for a very long time. She stood to inherit somewhere between $200,000 and $250,000 um, in the event of their death. The way that she was portrayed was that she was a greedy woman and she was depend financially dependent on her parents, that she owed them an upwards of $40,000. Deborah Perringer, when she testified, she talked about the financial relationship between her parents. Uh, she explained that yes, her parents had given her and her husband money over the years, that it was something that they wanted to do. The defense also claimed that Deborah was not strong enough to commit the killings. They maintained the murder was a revenge killing done by an ex-convict, but experts for the prosecution testified that the choice of murder weapon did not fit the profile and that Deborah could have committed the double homicide.
I thought that the use of the four skillets as a murder weapon, that this was someone who had come back from prison to track him down, to kill him at, out of revenge for having you know, testified against him or in some way sent him off to prison. You're not gonna bring a cast iron skillet over there to murder him with. It was obviously there. It was just a weapon of opportunity. We believe that on the morning of, the de uh, of their death that Mr. Courtney probably got into some sort of a verbal altercation with Deborah and that the assault started on Mr. Courtney. Based upon the way that the crime scene was found, it appears that Miss Courtney arrived home either during the middle of this or immediately thereafter and found her husband either dead or bleeding and found her daughter there. The state contended that Deborah probably was caught in the act or something had happened where, where Miss Courtney had walked in and found this going on and then she didn't have any choice but to go after her mother. Well, the prosecution's theory on on the killing was that, that somehow, uh, you know, in the heat of passion, uh, the adrenaline flowing, that, that uh, Deborah had this, you know, uh, exceptional strength to be able to uh, hit somebody with a, with a cast iron skillet, hard enough to break the skillet, uh, and to beat two people to death without being or overcome by them, uh, especially a trained police officer. It would have taken you know, some, some severe strength. I, I don't think Deborah matches that kind of brute strength. There was no DNA evidence ever linking anyone else to the crime. Based upon the timeline that we have of Mr. Courtney's morning, Mrs. Courtney's morning, and then the time that Deborah Perringer was there, that they were the only three people who were in the home. On January 20th, 2003, the jury returned their verdict, guilty of capital murder. I was just in a fog. Um, I just couldn't believe it. Well, I, I was the one that cried. I, I started crying, and they took me out of the court. For the offense of capital murder, since the death penalty was waived, the sentence is an automatic life sentence. And for capital murder, that means 40 calendar years that she'll have to serve before she's eligible for parole. I would be 89 years old when I would be eligible for parole. We were satisfied that we brought uh, Lloyd Nagnus's killer to justice. We were certainly saddened by the fact that we had to prosecute their daughter to do so. I mean, I don't think there was anybody in law enforcement who took pleasure in the fact that we had to put Lloyd Agnes' Courtney's own daughter in prison for this murder, but that's what justice required. Justice was not done in Deborah's case. Deborah is not guilty. And the evidence to support that was not clearly represented. So no, I don't believe justice was done in this case. 48-year-old Perringer was incarcerated at the Maximum Security Facility in Gatesville, Texas. She's been in prison for five years and has appealed her case. Her first appeal was rejected, and she's now working on her second, focusing on new evidence. There were, and it's sort of unusual that Agnes, uh, uh, Courtney's ring uh, was found. It had several hairs in it. But there wasn't anything that linked the, uh, the hairs to anybody in the house. They weren't Agnes's hairs, they weren't uh, Lloyd Courtney's hairs, uh, and they weren't Deborah Perringer's hairs. That's an unsolved mystery that, that again, adds to uh, the question of whether or not Deborah's in jail for something she didn't do. There was also the DNA uh, of a unknown individual found on the uh, caller ID box. Again, giving you another potential that somebody else was there. While she waits for news about a second appeal, Deborah relies on her faith. My spirituality has actually grown, but uh, it gets tested quite often. I do a lot of Bible studies, and I uh, do my best to stay out of trouble. Deborah's husband, her 15-year-old daughter Angela, and several of her friends continue to support her. My husband and daughter are 100% behind me. I have uh, four visitors that come regularly. I go see Deborah once a month, and I drive uh, one way, 165 miles. I I'm convinced that, uh, that she's guilty and she deserves that sentence. Deborah maintains her innocence. She still grieves for the loss of her parents. Well, I see myself uh, leaving prison in 2008, and I'm going to go home and enjoy my retirement. I'm just going to enjoy life. One day, my world was perfect. 
and the next day my heart was ripped out and not a day goes by that I don't think about my parents. I feel their, their spirit with me always because we were so close um, that I'll never replace them. Next up on this episode of Women Behind Bars, a woman is on the run for two murders. When he killed um, Lawrence Tasker, I had no doubt that he would not hesitate to kill me too if I didn't do what he wanted me to. For more information about Women Behind Bars, go to www.wetv.com. On June 23, 1978, 20-year-old Lawrence Hasker was found dead near the picturesque site of Hanama Bay. He was walked down the access road to Hanama Bay and shot twice. But it would take police almost a year to link Hasker's death to Marianne Acker and her husband William. Both were already serving time in California for the murder of another man, Cesario Arasa. After coming to Hawaii and committing the crime, the Ackers left Hawaii under assumed names. In a case of he said, she said, William Acker claimed Mary Ann killed Lawrence Hasker, while she maintained it was her husband who pulled the trigger. Was Mary Ann Acker a cold-blooded murderer, or was she the unwilling participant in her husband's schemes? At three months old, Marianne Acker was adopted by a devout Mormon family. She grew up with one sister in Phoenix, Arizona, where her life revolved around school and church. My childhood was a pretty normal childhood. I grew up in a middle-class home. Um, Mom pretty much stayed home with me when I was a kid. My family was a very religious family. They were Latter-day Saints. I was raised in the Mormon church. But for Marianne, her idyllic life came to an end when her parents moved from Phoenix to Yuma, Arizona. That's when I started getting kind of ticked off about life in general because my parents disrupted my 14-year-old little world. I started questioning the church and the teachings. Marianne decided that when she graduated high school, she would move back to Phoenix to be with her friends. I had no goals, no direction. I just knew I wanted to get out of Yuma and away from mom and dad. After graduation from high school in 1977, Marianne went back to Phoenix, got an apartment, a job, and met 28-year-old William Acker, who was working at a local hardware store. I met my co-defendant at work when I was 18 years old. Um, his sister introduced us. Linda Spaulding was a juror in Marianne's case. She wrote a book about Marianne's life. I think when Marianne met William, she was naive. She'd had other boyfriends, she'd been to parties. Uh, but she lived in this very restrictive home environment. He had that bad boy image. He was 10 years older than me, and there was that part of me, mom and dad will just absolutely hate him. I was already so much in thrall with him, I needed him in my life. I was just very much a people pleaser, very, you know, I needed a relationship. But William Acker's charisma and good looks hit a mysterious dark past that Marianne would not discover until it was too late. He had been in custody for 14 of his 29 years. Uh, Marianne didn't know that, obviously. Uh, there was some discussion about him being on parole, and he uh, downplayed that issue significantly. No one really knows. Uh, very much about him, except that he had numerous arrests and he was incarcerated for all but 14 months of his adult life. All of a sudden he was living with me. Within about eight weeks, he was talking about getting married. She remembers being in love with him and how, you know, incredibly strong a feeling that was. In April of 1978, William and Marianne were married. Shortly after, Marianne claims William started becoming controlling. When I first noticed William was isolating me from my family and friends, it was when he just alienated my best friend. That was the first time he just really shoved somebody out of my life. He'd separated her from her world and what she knew of herself. In June 1978, according to Marianne, William suggested that they go to Hawaii to visit relatives and have a belated honeymoon. When we got over to Hawaii, 
He didn't want me calling my parents and telling him where we were going. It's all a big secret. And they have to register and do everything under her maiden name because he has jumped parole in order to make this honeymoon trip. Still unaware of William's extensive criminal past, Marianne went along with his plan. After vacationing in Hawaii, Marianne claims William decided he wanted to stay there permanently. They get to Hawaii, they get an apartment, and they run out of money. I started to say, well, I'll go get a job. But suddenly, now he didn't want me working. And I realized now that was just because he wanted the control of me. He talked about robbing tourists. So she doesn't want to do robberies. He wants to do robberies. And I was arguing with him about that. And suddenly, he held a gun on me and threatened me. Bitch, if you don't do what I tell you, I'll kill you. And that was when it began. At that point, I didn't think about trying to get away. I mean, I'm on this island, thousands of miles, you know, from my family, from everything I knew. And then he started threatening my family, that if I left him, if I tried to report him, if I did anything, he would have my family killed. On June 10th, 1978, to pay for their new life in Hawaii, the couple's crime spree began. He wanted me to pick up men in bars, basically. I was just this little wallflower, not approaching anybody, until he would come back over and say, hey, go talk to that guy over there. At the bar, the Ackers met their first victim, Joe Leach, who lived in Hawaii. According to Marianne, William used her as the bait to lure in the victim. William came up and introduced himself as my brother and suggested that me and this man go someplace else and dance, it was a better place or whatever. And hey, while we're on our way, can we drop him off someplace? So we went out to the man's car. Um, he got in the back seat and as we pulled out of the parking lot, he pulled the gun on the man and directed him where to go. William pulls a gun on him and they drive him out to Hanama Bay. They tie him up, they take his money, they take his car. He wanted me to tie the man up. I said, I don't know how to tie anybody up. I, you know, you're crazy. Well, here, hold the gun. You know, so I, I held the gun while he tied the man up. I was kind of on autopilot. I was doing what he told me to do. I became utterly terrified of him. Marianne and her husband, William, left their victim gagged and tied up on the side of the road at Hanama Bay. But after the Ackers drove off, he managed to free himself and make it to the police station three miles away. The police took Leach's information, but no arrests were immediately made. Meanwhile, 10 days after their first robbery, the couple went back to the same bar where William found their second victim. He met a guy and struck up a conversation with him while we were sitting around at the bar. And um, he pulled me to the side and started talking about wanting to rob this guy. 20-year-old Lawrence Hasker was a graduate of a local high school. He had been working as a boat deckhand, but was unemployed the night he met the Ackers. I tried anything I could think of to talk William out of this. By the same token, I could only go to a certain point before he would flip. We went back to our apartment, and while we were at our apartment, he pulled the gun on the guy, said he was robbing him, tied him up. We left, we took his car, left our apartment, found out where he lived, where the money was, my co-defendant had me go up to the apartment, get the money. And I'm still trying to not do this. I'm still trying to get out of this, but I go and I do what he tells me because he's still threatening. Once inside the apartment, Marianne found $400 in $20 bills hidden in a book inside a bureau. I come back and he's tied up. When they get to Hanama, which is a long drive, they pull in, Larry gets out of the car, William gets out of the car. And he tells me to wait for him. So I'm in the car waiting. I had been driving. And they walk off an embankment at the side of the road, and I hear gunshots. He was shot twice, once in the ankle, once in the head, and left to die here. And he comes back to the car, and he says, OK, let's go. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? He said, oh, you wouldn't understand. It was just something I had to do. But according to the testimony later given by William, it was Marianne who killed Larry Hasker. William Acker testified that he did what she told him to do, that she was the dominating person in the relationship. He said that 
she shot Hasker. When he killed um, Lawrence Hasker, it put to rest any doubt I may have had that he would carry out his threats against me and my family. This man's life did not matter to William. And by the same token, like I said, his threats became even more real. The next day it was like, I told him, I said, look, I just wanna go home. I don't care what you do, I just wanna go home. He said, no, we're leaving. We're going back to the mainland. When Women Behind Bars continues, Marianne and her husband take their crime spree across the ocean to California. And he looked at me and he said, you want me to cop to a murder I didn't do? And I just looked him in the eye and said, didn't you do it, you son of a bitch? In June of 1978, Marianne Acker and her husband William robbed 20-year-old Larry Hasker after meeting him in a hotel bar in Waikiki, Hawaii. They would each claim the other shot and left him to die on the side of a road. But the trail of blood would not end there as the couple fled Hawaii to California. They were hitchhiking from Northern California down to Los, the Los Angeles area. A young man named Cesario Araza picked them up in his pickup truck. And this guy stopped and gave us a ride. And we were coming down, chatting. We stopped to get something to eat. Everything was fine. My co-defendant pulled the gun on him, told him to pull off to the side of the road, took his wallet, told him to get out of the vehicle, and they walked down an embankment, and I heard the gunshots. According to court documents, the couple left Cesario Arauza dead on the side of the road, took his vehicle, and drove to Los Angeles, where they stayed in a motel. A few days later, police say the couple robbed three convenience stores. On June 28th, Marianne was driving Arauza's car to get a pack of cigarettes for William, when the crime spree would finally come to an end. For the first time in this month's span, he sent me to the store. He gave me the keys to the car, he gave me money, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm out of here. And I got about another block away from the motel and got pulled over because they were looking for the car. When police arrested Marianne and Arauza's car, they were able to link the Ackers to the robberies. Marianne claims that William watched the police arrest her from an alcove in the motel. He then fled to Marianne's parents' home, where her father convinced William to turn himself in. And initially, we were just arrested on the robberies. Three weeks later, they filed the murder charges. According to Marianne, William told her that he would take full responsibility for the murder. We were supposed to start jury selection, and my attorney came to me and said, Marianne, they're offering you guys a deal. They will give you the robberies if he pleads to the murder. But William had something else in mind. And he looked at me and he said, you want me to cop to a murder I didn't do? And I just looked him in the eye and said, didn't you do it, you son of a bitch? After her arrest, Marianne discovered through her attorney that William had an extensive criminal record. The judge ordered William and Marianne's cases to be tried separately. In 1979, in a trial heard only by a judge, Marianne was found guilty of first-degree murder, robbery, and grand theft auto. I was sentenced to seven years to life. In a separate trial, William did not contest the charges against him and was convicted of first-degree murder and robbery. He was also sentenced to seven years to life and sent to a maximum security prison in California. Marianne was convicted of what amounts to felony murder because uh, she participated in a robbery in California, if you are a participant in a felony uh, crime where anyone is killed, uh, you are as responsible for that murder as the person who actually did the shooting. The judge convicted me, but he stated, it's not because I think you pulled the trigger. I don't believe you did, but you were there and you did nothing about it. Marianne was sent to a medium security facility in California to serve her time. Meanwhile, the murder of Lawrence Hasker in Hawaii still remained unsolved. After Marianne had been in prison for less than two months, Marianne's husband, William Acker, also in prison in California, asked to speak with the authorities. At one point, he sits down with the detective here in Los Angeles and says, oh, by the way, uh, there is a homicide in Hawaii that I know about. He proceeds to tell the detective in Los Angeles that Marianne was the shooter in Hawaii. The investigation was a joint effort between the local police force, Honolulu Police Department, and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. 
William had struck a plea agreement. He would plead guilty to the robbery of Lawrence Hasker, but the murder charges would be dropped in exchange for his testimony against Mary Ann. Linda Spaulding was a juror in the second trial. When Mary Ann came to the stand, she sat there in a slight sort of daze. She was so frightened or so repressed that she didn't leave much of an impression on the jury. The only evidence that they had was Acker's statements that she had shot and killed uh, Hasker in Hawaii. They gave him a polygraph test uh, concerning his statements about Marianne. He failed. But the polygraph test was not admissible in court. The prosecution presented their case. Jan Futa, the prosecutor, argued throughout the trial that Marianne was in control of William, that she told him what to do. The defense argued that William threatened Marianne and forced her to participate in the crimes. Our defense was to uh, show that William was not a credible witness, that he had reason to lie during the trial. The physical evidence did not support William's version of what occurred at the murder scene. When William was on the stand, he, uh, he, was, he was incredibly sort of charismatic and very cocky, and he did change his story a bit, but it was always, always that Marianne had shot Larry Hasker at Hanama Bay. The trial concluded after three weeks of testimony. Deliberating for less than two hours, Marianne's fate was in the hands of the jury. What I got second and third hand was that the jury was looking at the fact that she was present. She was a participant in at least the robberies and therefore with regard to the murder that she necessarily had to be punished for it. I thought that uh, the evidence uh, did not support the conviction of murder. Marion Acker committed these crimes in conjunction with her then husband, William Acker. She was responsible for the murder of Mr. Haskett. The prosecutor didn't really care, I believe, who did the murder as long as they got a conviction. Marianne was given 30 years to life for the murder of Lawrence Hasker. William was sentenced to 20 years. Marianne is serving concurrent life sentences. She was returned to California and has been serving those two sentences here in California since um, 1979. When I first arrived here, it was um, it was rather difficult to adjust. I was young. I was still a teenager. I needed to learn and grow up and deal with what I had done, what I had been through. Over time, Marianne has adjusted to prison life. I just completed a correspondence course on veterinary assistance. Um, we have a prison puppy program here. I'm a primary trainer. It helps me overcome so much with working with the dogs. We train them to be service dogs for handicapped people. And that gives me something bigger than all my stuff. It still is one thing that's very hard for me to deal with. The devastation that I caused to so many people, to my family, to the families of these young men. So many people suffered behind this. In 2005, Mary Ann Acker's murder charge in Hawaii was overturned. But later that year, Hawaii's district attorney's office decided to retry her. Mary Ann is currently waiting to begin her new trial in Hawaii. William remains in prison in California. My hopes for my future are really simple, life after prison. Um, I want to be reunited with the family that I do have. I want to get a job. I want simple things, and mainly just make a life for myself.